All right, folks, welcome back to The Property Couch. Yes, another big episode. And this week, we're gonna unpack the story of property investing through the lens and eyes of a property investment advisor. What do they do? How do they help? What separates the good ones from the bad ones? And in what's making property news, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a rant where I talk about what's the new legislation in South Australia around tenancy reform. I'm not happy, but wait till the end of the show where I tell you all about that. Anyway, let's rip into the show. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. Well, welcome back, folks, to another episode of The Property Couch. And we're still not with Bryce. He's still on his European adventure. So he will be back next week, everyone. So please stay tuned for that. But I have a super episode today where we're going to dive into the world of property investment through the lens of a property investment advisor. And yes, you do all know, hopefully, that I am a property investment advisor, but I haven't been face-to-face -face with clients for a long time. So I've brought a super expert in to help me unpack this story and look at what are some of the changes and the things that are happening from the lens of the property investment advisor. Now, before we go, I know that Bryce will be desperate to be talking about the footy, as we know that the pies have fallen out of the top eight uh, since we last caught up on the whole footy story. So we'll catch up with that next week. But I also have one other really important announcement, and that is around the more platform. I'm super excited, and this is attention to all property investment owners of a brand new tool that we've released inside the more platform in the web app version. So check out the web app version of the more platform, and you are now going to see property cash flow projection tool. Now, what does that mean? It effectively means that once you put in all of your rental income and any other income you might have relating to that property and all of the costs associated with that property, all the magic is done for you behind the scenes in allowing to work out the cash flow for the next 12 months on that particular property. And if you've also got depreciation, that's factored in. And if you've also got you know, the tax story, we do all of that back end work for you as well. So all of those calculations around what that looks like. So you're ultimately now going to know the cash flow outcome of that particular property. So are you going to have to kick in to service that property, or is the property going to be cash flow positive in terms of what that story looks like? And you'll see that pre-tax and then post-tax. So if you haven't checked it out, inside the show description, there is a link to the more website, which will tell you more about it and unpacks the, the property demo that we've got in there as well. So if you haven't checked that out, and if you're already an existing more user, it is now live. And Bryce and I will talk more about that next week as well. But I just wanted to give you uh, a bit of an update in terms of what's happening there. So please check that out for all property investment owners. Um, this is the one place now for you to manage all of that. Go on to the spreadsheets that you need. Everything can be organized and managed inside the more platform for you. All right, let's move on and get into the show. Firstly, obviously, I'm stepping in for Bryce. So I'm talking about the Mindset Minute. So this is something that has been pondering for me over the last two weeks in relation to, uh, I've just spent two weeks in Sri Lanka with my family on school holidays myself. And I've come back from that trip, obviously spending a lot of time day and night with the, with the boys. And there's just some teaching that we have to do. Obviously, as parents, we've got to talk about attitudes and behaviours. And one of the things that always comes up when you're talking with your kids is this whole idea of, oh, but Jack didn't have to do that or Harry saying, but or oh, Harry got more time with that or whatever that looks like. And so as parents, it is definitely our job in terms of talking about not the why should I have to do that or what did I miss out on, but how can I do that and how can I help? And that really is the theme of this episode in terms of you know, the benefit of helping others. And so we're going to see how a property investment advisor helps others. And I came across this Chinese proverb, which I think really sums up beautifully about the power of helping others. So let me just read through this proverb for you. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, in my case, and in the Chinese proverb's case, go fishing. 
If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. But if you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. And I think that is a really powerful message around why we should be always thinking about others and helping others where we can. And that's a perfect little segue into today's show where we're really unpacking the job of a property investment advisor and who better to do that whilst Bryce and I are away than one of our senior property investment advisors at Empower Wealth, someone who I have also been part of mentoring and training and Joel's now a superior property investment advisor than I will ever be. And Joel has helped over 850 uh, clients in terms of building out property investment plans for them. And I just feel super excited to have you on the show for the very first time, Joel. So welcome to the Property Couch. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of work that you do in terms of incredible work around helping your clients in terms of what they do and, and solving a lot of their problems around that particular story. So we're going to get into that later in this episode. But of course, what we always like to do is start with getting to know you a little bit more. And so we want to talk about your money backstory. And so what was money growing up like for you? Did you did you talk about money around the dinner table? And did you have a lot of exposure to money in your household? I was born in Hobart and, you know, youngest of two boys and a you know, my mum and dad were still together to this day, still very much in love. And But money wasn't that spoken about. You know, it wasn't that it, I think it was a little bit of an old school kind of mentality that you don't really talk about money. Um, however, you know, the both of them worked very, very hard, paid the mortgage off really, really early, you know, incredibly diligent. Dad travelled a lot, so which was obviously a fairly big sacrifice for them. And, you know, mum, mum, mum worked part time did a lot of the school pickups and drop-offs. So like quite traditional sort of household in that way. I, I always remember them writing out the budget and settling the bills every week, you know, what was going to be paid for and, and what wasn't. And given that they paid their mortgage off pretty early, dad then shifted into a fairly aggressive um, superannuation strategy. So um, at that point, uh, you know, he must have been, I reckon, mid-40s. I was still quite like fairly young. Um, and so a lot of superannuation investment, fearful of debt, I'll tell you that. Yeah, they were fearful yeah. of debt. They lived through 19% interest rates and everything and had some pretty scary conversations about what they were going to do. And then the fear became a reality when the GFC hit. And so because mum and dad had most of their wealth outside of their home in the stock market for the most part in their super yeah. funds, yeah. they lost a fair bit. Um, and I was about 18 or 19 at the time. So just starting to sort of th really think about this stuff. And, yeah. you know, the long story short is that's what kind of got me interested into money and investment and is probably the seminal moment that I started thinking about doing this kind of work. Now, before then, tell us a little bit about sort of, did you have a part-time job or were you doing anything? And then, you know, did you have a dollar mites account or anything that was... <laughs> Sort of yes. basic around sort of managing your your bank accounts. Yeah, we had a do I had a dollar mine account. You know, my brother and I did the pocket money thing, and I always had to set the table. And still to this day, I have a real thing that the cutlery has to be straight. It just <laughs> grinds my gears. Um, and then I got my first job at Target in when I was about fifteen, and um, you know, twelve hour shift on the door. On the second shift, I thought this isn't what I want to do very long. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I did that in Big W for a couple of years. So lots of retail and customer service experience. And, and that's and with my musical background, a lot of it was in sort of the, you know, in the old days, the CDs and DVDs and that sort yeah. of thing. Um, and then uh, I ended up moving into a role with the local music shop down there, yep. which as a musician was the holy grail. Yes, right. of course. Just loved it. Got to just sit around playing with guitars all day. And <laughs> um, and then after school, I finished, I, I, I went through a, a couple of years or a year of uni. Yeah. Um, only one year in music and realised I didn't need a piece of paper to be able to play guitar. And then did a project management traineeship at the same company that my dad worked at for 30 odd years. Yeah. Um, and soon after completing that, I um, I was made redundant pretty quick. And then I flew the coop and moved to Melbourne in 2009. 
And so let's talk about the um, the money story there. Did you, I mean, the guitars sound like your thing, CDs. I, I know I remember when I was younger, I'd buy a couple of CDs every every payday. That was, yeah. you know, sort of my little short-term um, <laughs> treat to myself. Um, yeah. Did you, did, you know, did you find a lot of pressure on you about, you know, keeping cool and, and keep having all the latest things that all you, your mates and all that had? I mean, was money a big thing? Uh, for you as as a young young man, I think so. I think it was the utility of it. Like obviously, being an active musician in the scene and everything as well. Like you know, you had to have the gear. And I only have three guitars in this household, and at one point I had seven. So <laughs> you know, um, it was a, a as they say about boats, like a hole in the water you pour money into. Well, that's just another thing that's in that same category. But you know, it was a passion and a love. But um, you know, I mean. We never went without my brother and I. There was, yeah. you know, there were times where the answer was no, but it was certainly not the most common response. I had to earn it. I had to, I had to play guitar for a good twelve months before mum and dad would buy one for me. Yeah, you know, and so they instilled that sort of you've got to save and you've got that level of responsibility before you can have the the sugar hit. So that's pretty good. I mean, a bit of delayed gratification in terms of is yeah. this is this going to be a fad for you? Is this yeah. going to be something that's you know going to be lifelong and and understanding yeah. that and then making that financial commitment to to obviously make you happy. So, look, that's that's a terrific little backstory there. So thank you for sharing that. So it's obviously you know a pretty safe middle class upbringing in in the sort of Hobart Tassie area. So that sort of tells us a little bit about that story. Now let's move along to obviously a property investment advisor. Now we've We've talked a lot generally in terms of the conversations that Bryce and I have where I'm wearing my property investment advisor hat, but, mm. but you're, you've done 10 years of this and you've now, as I said uh, in the intro, you've got over 850 plans, so property portfolio or property plans that we deliver here to our clients. So it's an awesome sort of um, catalogue of work that you've been able to build up. So, But for some of those newer listeners to the pod, um, it's probably a good time to sort of sit back, and I was thinking this is a great sort of story for the episode in terms of what is a what is a property investment advisor? How do they work? What do they do? So I thought we'd just start with tell us, you know, in terms of about a property investment advisor role. So technically, what does a property investment advisor do? Well, lots of things. I mean, at the end of the day, my job is to help people gain context on what they're doing and where they're trying to get to. You know, um, usually the first things that we tend to focus on is what the client's after. What are they trying to do? What's the why? Why are you yeah. looking at doing this, right? Um, my job is to put the, I guess, the technical knowledge behind that to help them get to that destination that they're looking at. We do that by, you know, taking stock of all of their situation, getting them to fill in all their information in more, and then we put it into a simulation. And, you know, we have lots of different levers we can pull in there that, you know, another child no kids, a home upgrade, that sort of thing, so that we can start to make sure that the, the um, if you like, the, the strategy that they're implementing fits what they're trying to do as opposed to them trying to retrofit everything that they are trying to do. Beautiful. Yeah, mate, that's right. I think it's really important that people understand with those simulations and looking at all of those more sophisticated um, modelling it does allow for a bit of an optimization story. So I think I think that really does help sort of un people understand. So effectively what we're trying to do as property investment advisors is to work out a pathway forward that's feasible um, and then trying to sequence that and get the priorities right so the customer feels happy and excited about that. And I think that's that's really good. I think the next part of the question that I'm, I'm keen to get your feedback on is, you know, there's property investment advisors and there's property investment advisors. And I'll give you a little bit of flavour to that. Like obviously as the chair of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia for I think it was about five or six years that I held that seat. Mm. Um, effectively, that's the peak association for the industry. And so inside there, I saw all different types of models and, and ways in which uh, people operate. And I think, you know, what's clear about the way in which um, we like to operate is that there are different types of, of ways in which they can do that. So can you just sort of share with me, you know, in terms of some of the observations that you know about sort of what property investment advisors do and what some do and what others don't? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, personal experience in Power Wealth wasn't my first position as a 
property investment advisor, we'll call it, right? Yeah, yeah. I came into the industry not long after I moved to Melbourne um, because of that interest that I had and the, you know, the mathematical bend that I tend to tend to have. And, you know, I was 22 at the time, you know, and I got into it because there was a, um, I got an opportunity, I should say, because a friend of a friend was working for a company, shall remain nameless. But my job, I came in as the junior guy and I had to go into people's houses and effectively scare the proverbial out of them to get them to buy an investment property that they don't necessarily understand or want. And so as that, in that role, I had a fundamental, fundamental ethical conflict, right? Because my job was basically to just get people to buy. And if they could spend 700,000, they spent 700,000. If they could only spend five, they spent 500,000. There was no, you know, um, objectivity around it, right? It was basically spend what they can spend and their, their own problems are their own. And over a course of about two years, I started to get my wits about me with what was going on a little bit more, you know, starting to grow up into um, and started to think this is not it, you know, this is not it. And so I left the industry and I came back for Empower Wealth, um, you know, and the thing about Empower Wealth is that and the reason I'm still here 10 years later with no ethical conflict is that it is the fee for service. And I can tell people what they need to know, you know, it's not just about buying a property. You might have other goals, you know. I want to know if you want to upgrade the home. I want to know if you want to have children. And all of those things need to play into it. So most property investment advisors on, out there are no qualification, no piece of paper. They've just basically had a suit, got a suit and a haircut, and they can go and tell you to buy the most expensive things you'll ever buy with very little opportunity for recourse if it doesn't work out. Yeah, look, I, I, terrifying I, I, if you think about it. It's totally terrifying. And I remember when, you know, we were growing the business and we were, you know, recruiting new people. And I'd have people who came from the sort of dark side coming in and, and I'd have, you know, chats with them. Tell us about what you do. I go mm. into people's households and I talk about, you know, it's only going to cost them $28 uh, yeah. a week because of the tax story there. And I, you know, yep. scare the fact that, to your point, and I tell them that, you know, that they're not going to have enough money in retirement. They're going to run out of money. And I was just like, is that really true? And, you know, like like as we were having those conversations, I was sort of challenging them about the work that they were doing to sort of say, is that, do you, do you, you know, but they were naive, you know, and yep. Bryce tells that story as well. He was, yeah, he was an enthusiastic amateur and he didn't know any different at the time. Yep. And the same with you, you were young, you were obviously impressionable with the people who were teaching you at the time. And, yep. and I've, I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of young people, you know, who do that type of work and they just don't know anything different. And until they then obviously go on a journey of actually there's more to this and there's a bigger story, um, yeah. I think that, that that's an important message for most people to know. And I reckon we're going to touch on that later in the episode in terms of, you know, um, the, the knowledge that customers also have in terms of what choices they have around. Yeah. And that's, that's why I wanted to sort of just highlight that point around, you know, there are doctors and then there are doctors and then there are doctors. Well, it's also very true around uh, property investment advisors. So there are property investment advisors who really do this work part time. OK, so it's a part of maybe they're a buyer's agent and they're sort of putting those two things together. So they're sort of doing potentially the strategy and then do, then doing the execution on the strategy. But there are also lots of property investment advisors who, to your point, are sales agents for developers yeah. or property spruikers or those types of things. And, and I think it's just important for people to understand that there's a real mixture of not only the, the, the type of operators who, who say they're property investment advisors, and there's also a level of um, detail and service that they go into. So, so, you know, what sort of finished product does a customer get? In yeah. some cases, they could get a one or two page sort of summary of the cash flow projections on the individual property with no no sort of indication or ingestion of that information into um, their overall financial position. And then there are there are others who, you know, they might get a, a three page report on the property that they're buying or so forth. So it's very yeah. limited. Um, whereas, yeah. you know, let's talk about um, you know, PIPA and the QPIA course. So qualified property investment advisor. You did say, you know, as you were learning the industry and, and building up some of that experience. Um, and all of our team, obviously, are QPIA. So 
Tell us a little bit about what is the Qualified Property Investment Advisor and, and how did you go about getting that qualification? Well, it was sort of the first thing that we said we had to do when I started working here, right? Um, because, you know, you're giving people advice on, like I said before, the most expensive things they ever buy. And yeah. so having a level of or a minimum standard of um, quality of advice out there, but also really importantly, abiding by a code of conduct is just it's key right so qpia run through pipa property investment professionals of australia and it's effectively well i, I can I, it took me quite some time um to get it all done because it's no it's no walk in the park right like a lot of people sort of think oh you can just almost just go and pay for the, these things nowadays but you can't right there is a level of requirement and discipline and hours and hours and hours and proof of concept that you've got to provide yeah, so that's six models or six, yeah. you know, six Module, yeah. modules in yeah. terms of our, and and ultimately, you know, the goal of that, I mean, I know because I'm a co-contributor to the course material these days. Oh, you wrote it. Um, you know, I, well, not the first version. So when I did my QPIA, it um, was part of Deakin Prime. And so it was part of Deakin University and sort of their their side sort of online training course. So I did mine part-time over two and a half years. And I know Again, for, for all of our QPIs in our business, um, we get them to do that over a course of 12 months as the two years of training that yeah. we get them to go through. So, so that's, the, that's the story that we have for, for building up the skill sets and the knowledge. Because to your mm. point, you're playing with households, financial future. Like it's really important. I mean, this is, uh, you mentioned yeah. it earlier, it's the biggest financial decision that many are going to make outside of their own or occupied home. So I think it's yeah. really important that that you have a lot of rigor around not only the knowledge that you have and the solution and the problem solving skills that you develop in helping households, but it's also about making sure that you've got a robust a uh, lot of knowledge around risk profile, around goals and objectives and all of those other key parts about that. And I think that's probably, you know, a good segue into my final question in this area to sort of help the our community get an understanding of the different types of property investment advisors out in the marketplace. But mm. what do you think it is that sort of separates the work that you do uh, compared to some of these others who might be, say, part-timers or who have a different approach um, yeah. in terms of the work that they do? Well, the biggest thing is the context and the story around it. I'm, I'm as interested, if not more interested, in all those other life priorities that you've got than I am with a said investment that we're going to recommend, because your your property should fit your strategy. Your strategy should not have to change to fit a property, right? So I'm much more interested in the individual, the couple's goals, their future, what they're trying to get to, because we can buy a property that can help facilitate that or we can buy a property that puts that in you know in question very very easily so it's a holistic approach it's much more about all those other things than just purchasing a property we also do some you know we do very long-term projections yeah you know, and you know 30 40 50 years and the long term should be informing the short term you know we, we reap what we sow and we don't want to buy more of these things in theory than we have to. They're expensive and we just want to get them right. We've only got so many chances to get it right. So, you know, we do long-term projections. It's pretty sophisticated modelling. I mean, we could go into some of the numbers and the variables and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's really just about making sure that that person or that couple has a clear roadmap of all the things they want to do, not just accumulating property for the sake of it. Yeah, and, we, and I know that, um, you know, we, I've mentioned before that for any sort of, we've got about 43 variables that run through the models. And so any sort of change to one of those variables is about 230,000 calculations that the great late yeah. Michael Pope and all, and you and I, when we were doing, when we first built this magical simulator was, you know, sort of doing all that number crunching. But what what I, you know, took a while for me to learn when I was, you know, obviously we innovated this product um, over 10 years ago now, Um what was also interesting is that when we we didn't want the information overload to the customer, what we wanted to do is just tell a simple story. But if they do need to make you know that really rigor, and there are plenty of people out there who love the detail, but they're yeah. not the majority. The majority of people just want to basically see the highlights, see the summary, and know that all of that rigor is in behind it. 
But, you know, yeah. same sort of thing. I, I jump on a plane that flies from point A to point B. I know there are, you know, kilometres and kilometres of cables and wires and technical instruments and indicators and, you know, sensors and all of that that sort of run the plane. I don't really want to know. I just want to make sure I get. And so I think that's also another story. But to know that it's all there, to know that there's, it's all detailed and tested and audited and all of that is, is part of that rigour. Um, yeah. There's one other thing that I also wanted to highlight. One of the other big things that, that um, you know, sort of you and I and we do differently is we actually don't recommend a particular property. We mentioned earlier with yeah. some of those in-house consultants and some of those businesses who are really trying to sell a property. We actually don't do that, do we? No, no, we don't. And I mean, it's very good reason because we buy every property bespoke per brief at the end of the day, right? You don't come in and see a catalogue of all these great places to look at. So what happens is when I'm building out my plans, I'm looking at, again, strategy first. Location and asset type are absolutely secondary. So I'm looking at things like price point, growth, yield, lending, tax, cash flow, ownership, those sorts of things, and yeah. how they play into through our, through our simulation into that person's situation. So I've got to make sure that the numbers make sense first. Then we pass it to a buyer's advocate that actually has to go and fulfill that brief. Yeah. So to an extent, I'm agnostic to where you buy, you know, like in a way, I don't care. Provided it does your numbers, it could be in all the room. But we just want to make sure that all the strategy is put in place first before we start getting, if you like, um, uh, building a bias around a preferred location first. Yeah, I think there's optimization going on there. And, and exactly to that point, it's just really about sort of understanding all of those and putting that order of priority together. So I think you've summarized that beautifully. Let's let's move on now. So that sort of just gives you an idea. The summary there is really simple, that there is lots of different types of approaches out there. Our approach is very much detailed. It's very much bespoke uh, and tailored to each case, hole, uh, case household. I mean, it's a case by case not a typical one-size-fits-all solution. So True. Let's, I think if I can just go. add something there, mate, as well, just back to the code of conduct and the different ways that um, advisors can get paid out there. Pro tip, if you're having a conversation with someone that says they're advisor, an advisor, just ask how they're paid because yeah. you'll find out pretty quick if you're in the right place or not. <laughs> yeah. you know? And That's if they can't explain service. that to you, there's a problem, right? If they're not flat fee and fee for service and they don't have anything riding on the content of the advice that they give, walk away. Yeah, I think a nice bit of advice. Okay, let's now move on in terms of what does the approach look like? So what is what is the, the sort of pathway or, or process that a client might go through when they're potentially thinking like, okay, well, maybe I do want to sit down and have a chat with a property investment advisor and see what value they bring to the table. So, so take us through the setup and, and in terms of if someone wants an initial consultation, what does that look like? Well, they put submitted inquiry through the website and then they get um, access to the more platform and we ask them to put in just basic information at first, right? Not, yep. not line by line. I mean, they can go as deep as they like, but yep. to have a chat, we just want a snapshot, you know, rough understanding of everything. Then we'll book an appointment and it's usually via Zoom in today's day and age, right? Um, and it's usually a 45 minute to an hour appointment and it's really an opportunity to get to know each other. And again, like I say, focus on those, why are we here? Why are we actually bothering to do it? Why now? What are we trying to get to? So that there's, so that I've got a good understanding of the goals and desires. And then we talk about next steps. You know, how do we actually put this together? Why would it potentially work? Um, and then we talk about engaging to move forward with a plan. Right, because you can't solve everything in that first initial. Like there is, uh, you know, the rigor around the numbers. Problems in that one. Yeah, that's right. So, so that's that's an important mind. So that's what I wanted to spend a bit of time in unpacking, right? Because this is where, you know, you really start to see what what an actual property investment advisor is doing. Um, so I want to sort of get right into the nitty gritty and unpack some of those areas. So, the the, the fundamental thing that that I think it's really important is. How do, how do you align investing with a client's overall priorities and their goals? What are, you, what are you trying to, I suppose, get out of the customers so you can start to order those priorities? Probably two main things is the big life events 
you know, those big things that we, we want to have and they're individualized for certain people. Not everybody wants to buy the home. Not everybody wants to have children. A common one I get is people want to throw the shackles off for 12 months. How do I afford to do that and go backpacking in Paraguay? All right, cool. We can work through those things. Yeah. Um, so that's the main one is probably the big lifestyle events. Um, but the other main part is around the fears and the emotions and the baggage that we all carry, especially with money. Yeah. And a lot of that is invisible until we talk through it, right? Um, and so I'm really keen to, I'm, in those first that first meeting, I'm really just listening. I'm asking lots of questions. I'm really listening to the answers because if in a way I'm, I'm kind of trying to diagnose what's going on, you know? And most of us have an idea about what we want, but a lot of us don't know what really holds us back. And so um, trying to undercover and have good conversations around what their concerns are is as important as, you know, the big picture and the exciting optimism. I, I think, you know, I've talked about this earlier on other episodes as well, but it's also about trying to understand if if it's a couple that they're actually on yeah. the same page. Yeah. You know, tell us tell us about how you sort of handle those conversations. Usually you can tell. Now, normally there's one person driving the conversation, yep. right? Yep. There's the the property couch disciple that's listening to every episode. Um, and then sometimes the the partner doesn't even know who we are or doesn't even know why they're there. Sometimes they're there under sufferance, yes. which can make it tricky, right? Um, most people are coming in to those meetings fairly open and ready to have a conversation. But when you have that disconnect between a couple, it's usually on a lifestyle-based thing, right? Like, you know, um, someone's really, really future oriented, the delay gratification, sometimes to a fault. And then sometimes the other person is YOLO, right? For now, let's live for now and don't worry about all that sort of stuff because it's, it, it's too abstract. In extreme cases, that can cause quite a lot of tension. It can cause arguments. I have yep. been in the middle of some of those arguments in my time and that's, that's an experience. So yep. there's a level of therapy that can come with this sometimes, right? Um, but again, it's a case of letting sh everyone be heard and making sure we understand um, that it's not a complete compromise from left to right, right? Like quite often the person that is totally on board wants to invest really aggressively and sacrifice now is wrong. And sometimes as well, the person that just wants to live for now is wrong. They've got to come and meet in the middle somewhere. And quite often I think that compromise is not as much as what they actually think it's going to be. I think that's that relationship counselling piece that you're bringing. Like, I mean, ultimately in financial services, um, you are a trusted advisor and, and they are, you know, they're, we're trying to make sure that we build a level of trust and that there is transparency in the conversation. If that full transparency isn't in the conversation in that sort of two-way, three-way dialogue, ultimately yeah. the plan is going to be insufficient to address potentially all of those barriers and challenges of which households overcome. So I think, and, and I mean, I, I know in my experience when I was doing all of the planning work I did for years, um, talking about number of children, getting alignment around those, talking about the cost of raising kids, the timing of when you actually start raising that. I've, I've also been quite vocal around, you know, sort of how households will be financially challenged if they effectively have children before they actually put, you know, at least a property on the ladder. That's always yeah. going to put them on the back foot in terms of being able to be financially comfortable, uh, let yeah. alone being financially successful. And I think, yeah. you know, th those are difficult decisions, but they're, they're done with trust. They're done where, with integrity and, you yeah. know, and in a, in a humble type of way, doesn't, doesn't that apply yeah, out? Yeah, correct. I mean, it's all done with, out of respect and sensitivity because we've all gone through the same sort of conversations, you know. Um, we, I've, I've got a little boy and Angela and I sometimes disagree about what our prioritisations of our money should be, but that's life. We're, you know, we're going to work through all those sorts of things. And my job as a property investment advisor is to help get us enough on the same page so we can move forward. Because if that disconnect remains, regardless of doing a plan and that being a great little experience, they won't move forward if it's not been properly addressed. Well, I mean, look at look at examples of, of you and I. Like, I mean, obviously, we're, you know, we're good buddies as well as being colleagues. 
um, you run ideas via me around, you know, what you're looking to do because you can get too emotionally attached. I do the same. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of saying, hey, 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 Joel, can you actually run this number? Am I thinking right here around whether we should be doing that? So, yeah. you know, and I think that that's that, you know, that validation you get in terms because you can get very emotionally attached to yeah. certain aspects or you've got anchoring or biases yeah. and and that's all part of the learning journey. And in my mind, that's that's some of the critical value that a yeah. customer gets in terms of going through that process. I think outsourcing, it's really, really helpful because, yeah, you can get in your own way. Yeah, the number of calls right. over the last 10 years have gone, Ben, what do you think? <laughs> and I know the answer, right? You but sometimes you just need someone that cares but doesn't care as much as you, yeah. so to speak. There's that emotional separation. And, the, and I think... We get quite a few people coming through to us that go, well, I've worked it out and I think I know what I want to do. So why haven't you done it? Well, because there's a doubt there. There's a fear and you don't want to mess it up. So, you know, having a property investment advisor, if I'm nothing more than a sounding board and I validate your thoughts, at least you can move forward with conviction. I might have I some different fears. I love, I love everything that you just said. And so I, let's look at some of the examples of some of the challenges. So what are, what are a couple of, of really simple examples that you've got that, that are those barriers in terms of that people need to get some confidence about before they move forward? Affordability is the main one. Yeah. You know, and, and if, you, if you listen to the media, you know, property is just becoming so unaffordable and interest rates are going to go up all the time and how are you ever going to be able to do it? Look, it's easier than people think. Yes, does it require some sacrifice and some setup and that sort of thing? Yeah, of course it does. But anything worth doing does. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the main risk or the main risk that people see at the moment or the challenges they see is how long or how long will rates stay, well, high relative yeah. to what we're all used to because they're not historically high by any stretch but yep. relative to what we're all used to. And the other one is the, the can I afford it today but can I afford it tomorrow? You know, you and I know we don't like transacting on these things and selling them out and trading in and yeah. out and that sort of stuff because that just erodes profits. You're on a, you know, you're on a highway to nowhere. And so the affordability part is important, but affording it in two years, five years, 10 years and putting some thought into how you're actually going to get through maternity leave, for example, afford childcare fees that are akin to private schooling, you know, and get through that sort of seven to 10 year period where most people are setting up their family yeah. life, you know, before they start to get a little bit of respite later on. So they're probably the main two. It comes back to people's anxiety around affordability and am I going to be able to, you know, give the kids what I what we want and what we want. And, and I guess also the risk of the home, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, one of the one of the interesting things about the work that we do um, is that it's not just property investing recommendations that we deliver. Do you want to talk more to that story? Because I think this is um, again um, a really important message that some property investment buyers all they're going to do is look at that next purchase and that's it. Yeah. But taking that holistic approach, tell us about um, you know what it is that we do because we do property advice. Across yeah. the board, we don't just do property investment advice. Property investment advice is a broad brushstroke at the end of the day, right? Because we are generally large advocates or strong advocates most of the time for a family home. I, I know I am because you can see a long-term um, trade-off that that can really, really help people long-term. So we get a lot of first-timers coming to us. Now, when I started back in 20, late 20, uh, 2014, we almost had none did we? Like a lot of the time it was the mid 40s, couple of kids, mortgages under control, you know, oh God, retirement, we need to think. Whereas now I would say that I would say probably 30 to 40% of the inquiry that we get are first timers. And so they're putting that, planting that flag and going, I think I need to get some advice now, but how do I get in? And so that's a really good example of, do you buy the investment? Yep. Do you buy the home? Like, and you go for your stamp duty concessions and your first home buyer step, or do you do a hybrid? So you're buying an investment, but you're going to move into it for your minimum 12 months requirement, et cetera, to get those concessions. And we do a lot of those. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know roughly how, like what the split is there Yeah. for that first one, 
Um, but you're usually, even if you're looking at that first home purchase, you're still thinking through that, th- thinking about that through the investment lens. Because how many first home buyers stay in that first place forever? Well, quite often we're helping singles who haven't met a spouse yet as well, for example. So there's probably a bigger family home upgrade down the line. Yeah, so, I really like the way you've summarised that. I mean, I, I look at the sort of audience segments and, and I don't like to sort of put people into groups or buckets, but we absolutely are getting more of those young aspiring Australians who are saying, I'm not yep. listening to the noise and I'm going to get started early and I'm going to think about either rent vesting or doing an, a hybrid, which is basically getting on the property ladder by getting an investment property first and having that supplementary income help me to start. But that, but I might move into it. I might use that as equity for a future owner occupier by yeah. purchase. I think then there is the young couple who have started the family but have that first home. So they're on that property yeah. ladder and they've built up a nice bit of equity sort of over the last three to five years. And they're starting to be really smart about yeah. making their money work harder for them. So they're putting some of that equity to work. And then, you know, basically that core audience that we've often been dealing with, which is, you know, the sort of couple that has the the young teenage kids um, who are like, we've got a fair bit of equity. We feel really on top of our mortgage at the moment. Um, our income's really strong. So we've got a really strong surplus. So do we pay down the debt on the family home yeah. or do we actually, you know, put that money to work and start thinking about the next decade or two? And that ultimately turns us from being financially comfortable to being really financially successful in terms yeah. of building up, uh, you know, a sort of several million dollar asset base for them for themselves and potentially that legacy for the family. And I think there's probably one other that sort of comes to mind is the ones that we're helping who've, who've, who've attempted property investment without doing a lot of research and have made a mistake. I mean, that's mm. the first 20 pod, you know, first 20 episodes of the pod is all around sort of, you know, helping those people who have basically gone and got a bad haircut or have been, yeah. you know, convinced that they're in and they're really frustrated. So we review that particular purchase yeah. and then look to get somewhere else. I think that talks to the fact that it's a tailored experience. So you yeah. like it's, I, I think uh, there's some misconceptions people have. It's too late. I'm too young, you know, um, and they, they sort of, a lot of people just don't think they can actually do it, you know, and like I've said, I, it's, it's, I think it's easier than a lot of people think. Well, not easy. I think it's simpler than a lot of people think. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's right. Well, when you've got someone holding your hand who's guiding you with years of experience and proven track record in terms of what they're doing, that, that, that's that got to give some comfort. I mean, it's the same comfort if I'm going for an operation. I want to have a surgeon who's who's basically trained hard and got a lot of experience so, you know, they don't mess it up. Yeah. In terms of, I mean, the other, I think, challenge that we also often see is but our property price is going to fall. I mean, you know, you only need to be on social media for five seconds where you've got the people who are like property prices are never going to fall and then all these people just wishing and hoping for property prices to fall, you know, the big crash that's coming. How do you um, deal with that challenge and, and, you know, and that fear and, and that those people have and and also then the, the underlying fear that's, that's associated with, which is around losing money? There's a lot of people that have this gut feeling around never wanting to lose money. So they never actually take action. I have that. I don't like losing money. You know, I, um, I have, I buy the odd lotto ticket, mate, but I, I don't buy it often enough to be worthwhile. Right. So, I mean, the the property price is falling one. Uh, Most people understand that there is a supply and demand issue in Australia and that property is, underpinned by owner occupiers, right? So it's the only investment class that isn't underpinned by investors. And that gives us comfort, right? Now, what are the things you can do should property prices fall? Well, you can get your house in order, right? We can sort out the plan to make sure that if there is a correction in the market because interest rates have gone up even further, that we can still afford it and we can make our way through. You know, there's an old adage, you only lose money when you sell, right? So... You know, assuming we're not talking about property prices dropping by 80%, which convinced me, but it's not going to happen, right, is that um, you you generally just need to trade through. And what does that mean? Well, maybe that means the next property's kicked down the can, down the road a little bit longer. Maybe you need to reconsider moving home and actually doing a renovation or, you know, those sorts of things. So, you know, 
our planning is not a perfect predictor, of course, right? Because the market is the market, but you can put buffers in place to make sure you can get through those things. Great example over the last two years, because I've been doing this for 10 years, I had the best part of eight years of glory days, right? Everything was going up, rates were coming down, you know, like property investment was pretty easy. Whereas in the last two years, obviously things have changed. And I have a lot of clients coming back to me going, we need to do a review or I'm contacting them going, hey, we probably should have a chat. And I've had, I don't think I've had one of those situations come up where that person has been completely exposed because of the property. Now they might have for personal circumstance, it could be an illness, you know, there could be other things that happen, but most of the people that we've helped have done well and are feeling relatively safe right now. Is it a pinchy? Yeah. Are some of them needing to make some changes? Yeah, you roll with the punches. That doesn't mean that you put it on the shelf and you leave it forever. I think it's a really nice point around the buffers and going on that educational journey. And so how we do that is obviously by, you know, if people really want to get into the weeds, we can show those models and those cash flow projections and people can see uh, the buffering that we do. So I think that the message here to our audience is if you're going to work with a property investment advisor, ask them about what sort of buffers and what sort of variables yeah. they've got in play. Because if, if you do say, what you know, what if illness, um, what if interest rates go even higher, what if, what if, what if? And if they can't then demonstrate that you've got cash flow buffers and reserves or or that they're starting off with a conservative view anyway, then, you know, ultimately it's like, well, you're going to have doubts. And I think yep. those doubts could be warranted. But if you yep. go on an education journey with your advisor and they are stepping you through and say, here, well, let's, let's model that out. Let's see if interest rates go another 2% higher and let's have a look at the equity buffers that you've got or the cash flow buffers that you've got. And let's, okay, so it's, you're going to, your money's going to last you another six years. Are interest rates going to stay that high for the next six years or whatever that may look like, right? And yeah. so ultimately then it's about, so you're overcoming that fear because that's that paralyzing fear of losing money. Remember that from a behavioral science point of view, um, losing something has double the impact on us than actually making a gain. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's really important for people if they are going to work with a professional to sort of understand that when they're talking to their property investment advisor. A big part of what we do is risk mitigation, you know, and we're making sure that you can do this and you can do it well and comfortably. Yeah. You know, I often say to people, I'm almost modeling a permanent recession in these things is one way to look at it. So yeah, and that's right. So we well, obviously job security is one of the first questions we ask, right? It's like, okay, yeah. what if we lose our job? Okay. Well, based on losing our job, You've got two years to find a new job or you've got a year and a half to find a new job. Does that give you a little bit of, oh, I should be able to find something by then. I mean, even if I'm stacking shelves or whatever that may look like or I've yeah. got to do a side hustle or drive an Uber, whatever that looks like. I mean, a lot of people then go, oh, okay. So, you know, you, you're again sort of highlighting those those yeah. potential risks. Yeah, exactly. Now, in terms of um, knowledge that a customer brings to the table, they're obviously on a learning journey when they come. Their financial, some have really great financial literacy, brilliant, um, you know, sort of number ideas. But there are a lot of others who might come to us who who are still learning um, and you know have got a, a good base lo load of knowledge through books and and podcasts and so forth. But what are some of the initial misconceptions that you see popping up from time to time? Probably the most common one is equity equaling borrowing capacity. Now they're yeah. related, but they're not the same. You know, like you could have all the equity in the world, but if you can't service a loan, you have no borrowing capacity. So that's a really common one that just because, you know, the property's gone up in value, it doesn't mean that money's yours yet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. People that's forget borrowing. that they've got to borrow the money and that, that exactly. lender wants to make sure that you can repay the money. And just because yep. you can sell all your assets doesn't necessarily uh, give them that comfort. So they have exactly. responsible lending obligations. So that's why it's a different story. And the other, the other main one is, and it's kind of understandable, but a lot of people think I'm a financial advisor, yeah. which I'm not, right? Like a financial advisor deals in licensed regulated products, superannuation funds, shares, insurances, those sorts of things. Direct property investment is not a regulated or licensed product. So most of them don't deal in it. Well, uh, to my knowledge, almost none of them do, Yeah, yep. which is really, that's, that's the core difference 
is I work in um, helping people build out their ideas and their thoughts and their property portfolios in a, with a similar set of motivations, if you like, but you're not a financial planner. You still need a financial planner in your team for that defense part that we talked about and maximizing your super and all of that sort of thing. Like it's, it's, it's all a package, so to speak, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think that's a, some really good messages in there in terms of now, now, you know, why have we got property investment advisors and why have we got financial planners? Because they are two different disciplines. And yep. to your point, um, most financial planners don't recommend direct property because it they, they aren't protected under their professional indemnity insurances because, you know, their their network group or the dealer group or their, their license doesn't allow them to talk about that. So that is, again, something we've got to keep educating the, the broader Australian community about, that if you think that a property investment advisor is a financial planner, they're actually not a licensed financial planner and they don't deal in licensed investment products. So again, if you're getting if you're getting a property investment advisor who's pitching to you to set up a self-managed super fund and invest, yeah. it, that run a mile. That's what I was going to say. They are, they are in breach of the law and they are outside of their purview in terms of what they can and can't do. So, um, you know, that's that's why it's really important. Again, we've got a qualification via the Peak Association and the code of conduct in which we operate under, but make no mistake, a property investment advisor is not a financial planner and they have different qualifications associated with the work that they do. Correct. All right, let's move on now. I think, um, you know, I, I love the the 500th episode that we did with, you know, Mike Gervais in terms of, you know, unbelievable work around mastery. And then mm. when, you're, when you're having a chat with someone who's just got that level of knowledge, you feel great, you feel empowered by talking to them, and then you go away and then you, you, you feel a little bit more vulnerable and you've got a few more questions. I, I'm really curious because I, I know, you know, any... Same when I'm talking complex tax with my tax advisor or whatever it may look like. I probably have a couple more questions that I didn't think about. Yeah, yeah. What, are some of the, what are some of the things that your customers keep coming back to you and, and want reassurance or reminders about in terms of that they're still on the right path? Oh, block out the noise. Block out the noise. You know, don't listen <laughs> to Uncle Bob because he's never done it. Yeah, yeah, we're playing the long game here, right? So... We're also connected nowadays. The media loves a bit of clickbait, as, as you and Bryce have established before. And yeah. at the end of the day, most people just need reminding of the eye on the prize and that there's going to be hard work in between. I say it's easy, but it doesn't mean that it's, no, it doesn't take level of commitment. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like there's going to be periods, we often see it, where your cash flows are going down for whatever reason. Now that's usually self-imposed through having children and stuff. And that can be a really stressful time because not only is your bank balance going down, but your sleep's deprived and you've got this brand new thing that you feel like you've got no idea how to handle. And so keeping the framework of this is the moment in time and we've prepared for this because money's stressful, mate. We know it, right? Yep. Like yep. at the end of the day, it's usually that just eye on the prize, keep doing what you said you're going to do. And that kind of, you know, the other thing is, is the milestones part of it. Like in our planning, we set everything to dates. Everything needs to be anchored to some sort of date. But a lot yep. of the conversations I'm having with people is the milestones more important. That property doesn't matter if it's six months that way or that way. Because in 2044, we're not going to care if it was six months that way or that way. Right. So I think, you know, it's that sort of philosophical thing that people kind of, you know, they, they um, overestimate what they can achieve in one small short year. Yeah, but yeah. then, you know, keeping an idea of how much you can achieve in 10 and maintaining that progress, it all centres back. This is what we said we're going to do. We knew this was coming. Yeah, it's a lovely piece of advice. It's a lovely piece of advice around there's going to be a little, little bit of flex, right? I mean, we're doing straight line projection modeling using compounding returns and lots of variables in there. So understanding that there's a little bit of effects, but staying on the pathway to the destination you want to go without too many mistakes or detours and all yep. of that, I think is a, a really nice way to sum that up. Brad says about the course correction on the plane. It's only on course 1% of the time or whatever, because yeah. there's an exact straight line. We're never going to get that exact straight line, but we have tolerances and we stay in them and we'll be fine. Yeah, love it, love it. So let, let's move on now to sort of obviously having done so many plans and and sort of seeing the journey, the learning journey and educational journey that the customer's going on and, and seeing how all of the, 
the sequencing is organised and all the cash flows and models are being projected out and the scenarios are being worked on. Where do you feel like the big aha moments start to, you know, sort of galvanise for the customer? In the strategy development meeting. It's the best meeting along the way. It's the third one. So, you know, the first couple are really fact-finding and establishing, yep. you know, um, the, the parameters we're working in. But when we get into strategy development, that's the first time I'm really bringing something of substance back to the client to be able to go, these are the scenarios we agreed we would look at and this is what it looks like. And, you, you know, like I liken that process to throwing paint at the canvas until we like what we see. Any of my clients listening have probably heard me say that, right? Because <laughs> it's collaborative, right? Yeah. We're, put, we're doing this together, right? And so I think... Um, where we get that first look of the cash flow graphs and the wealth graphs, like it, it's it's quite amazing how a couple of squiggly lines can change people's perspective. <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing. Like they are my favourite meetings by far, you know. But it's, it is, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's really where we are displaying our value. It's where we're giving you all the information that you need to make an informed decision, right? Like, yep. It, it, it's effectively the show and tell from the modeling work and all that's being done. So, yes, we call it internally a strategy development meeting with our customer. But for, yeah. for anyone who's thinking about using any type of property investment advisor, um, this is effectively where they say, I've listened, I've heard, these are the two scenarios that we might be looking at, and here's what this scenario looks like, and here's what this scenario looks like. So all of yeah. a sudden, all of the pieces of the puzzle, in your case, the canvas, that the artwork is starting to show itself out in terms yeah. of what that looks like. So I think that's a really nice, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, it is a rubber hitting the road moment and all of a sudden now, you know, you've made the invisible visible and I'm starting to get a little bit excited and you can start to see customers, you know, sort of thinking about, wow, this looks really good, which obviously I, I'm assuming now if everyone's dialed right into our conversation, it's what about when, okay, all of the wants and, and needs and everything that's been thrown in there. What about when it doesn't work? What, what, what happens then, mate? I mean, you know, a lot of people throw the kitchen sink at these things. And, like, yeah. to an extent, I encourage that to people, right? It's like if I don't know about something that you want, I'm not going to be able to address it. But, of course, everything within reason, everything in moderation. So, you know, this probably comes back to that, you know, um, that, that idea about the misconceptions about, you know, you can go and buy several properties if you want to in theory, but it is going to take some work. And the more of those other things you want to have, the flasher car, the fancier house, um, the more holidays, is all of those things are going to erode your capacity to be able to do it. So quite often, not, well, not, probably not as often as people think, because I think most people are fairly reasonable when they're coming here with a yeah. level of if you like self-responsibility of I've got to take care of business, right? So when you're having a conversation with someone that, or, or I pick up that I'm going to have to do some expectation management because yeah. we just don't have the resources, right? I try and front foot that as early as possible. And that's the hardest part of the job when you sort of have to bring people down a level, if you like, on, on their expectations because, you know, a lot of the, you know, the noise out there is that this is, you know, buy 10 and sell five and you can just keep buying and you, you and I know it better than most. And I think that when you are starting to see that there is this idea of I want this, 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 this three layers of cream, it's my responsibility to help you understand why that might not be possible. And yeah, it might hurt. And I'm so sensitive to these conversations and I feel my client's disappointment keenly, you yeah. know, but at the same time, you're paying me a fee to give you responsible advice. So if I don't tell you, I'm not worth the money. You know what I mean? So yeah, there, there's a there's a realism about these yeah. conversations. I mean, I can yeah. sit there on social envy on all of those social media, yeah. and and I'm seeing the Mr. Beasts and all of these young, you know, people making all these mega bucks and giving away gifts of fifty thousand dollars, and I just want to be just like them. And yep. then ultimately, you know, they're point zero 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 one percent of the global population, and you yep. want to try and land that plane, you know. Yep. So, so you're absolutely having realistic conversations with them. And I, yeah, I'm the same. You know, if they come in with a wish list of um, private jets, helicopter, I mean, because that marketing sells. Make yeah, yeah. no mistake, people want. 
You know, that's that's people looking like they're living their absolute best life and money is no problem for them. And so yeah. they they fantasize about that reality when in truth, and I think, you know, from our point of view, we know that the vast majority of the people who come and talk to us are realistic about yeah. that sort of particular story. But every now and then you do get uh, one or two of those people who are coming in and saying, well, Oh, but I'm seeing I'm seeing someone doing it on TikTok, or I'm seeing someone doing it on Facebook, or or whatever it is, Insta these yeah. days, or whatever that you know the platforms are. And it's so it, there is conversations, and and some of them are, if people's you know uh, thoughts are still blue sky and and r- unrealistic, we we have to set those expectations. You know, there's a real world example of that because I always say to my clients, if it can be a cake and eat it too scenario, why shouldn't it be within reason? Yep. And I have a, an old client who I probably did the plan for, I reckon, in 2017. And we were going through the process. It's back in our old Excel days, and we're going through his old fact find. And he said, can we add something? And I said, yeah, for sure. And he goes, I've always wanted, a, I can't remember exactly, it was like a mid-70s Stingray, right? Classic car, American yeah. car, like a beautiful thing. And he said, but... I, I, my, my wife's always saying no, right? And I said, well, when do you want it? And he said, well, I don't want it now, but I'd like to retire with it. And I said, well, let's build it in. You know, yeah. it's a $30,000 car or something. And we built it in. You know, she was sort of sitting in the background, you know, oh, God, you you guys. And then the <laughs> next time I saw them in 2019 for a review, we brought it forward. We were kicking a lot of goals and he said, ah, oh, you know, ever since that conversation, now you've let me know it's possible. I kind of want it now. <laughs> so we built it in. I spoke to him in 2022. Got the car. Got the car. I, 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 I love the ones about I had a, you know, sort of a, a time where someone wanted to do a sabbatical, take six months off and spend, you know, living in France for six months. So we built it in, you know, and then and, and the, the other stuff for me is also the, the kitchen bathroom renos, you know, yeah. the pools, like all of those other short-term sort of um, rewards that you yeah. get as part of building that out. Remembering that, you know, we're a little bit different because we build holistic models um, that do include, you know, your owner-occupied upgrades, downgrades, all of that. We're just not building an investment portfolio. We're actually building a complete package of your lifestyle by design. And I think that's yeah. that's really important in terms of what that looks like. Well, we're, mate, we could be talking about this all day. We we probably have to move it along a bit so yeah. there's so much to get through. But here's a couple of other things that I want to talk to and then we'll just do a quick quick, uh, quick fire question section in a moment. Let's talk about some of the feedback. So what's some of the most common feedback you get once people are seeing, you know, that you've, you're landing the plane for them, you're showing them a pathway forward? What's, what's some of that sort of instant feedback that you're getting? Oh, it's a sense of relief. It's a prevailing sense of relief. Because most people are coming to us because they don't feel like they can do it themselves and they need something shown to them that they can't otherwise work out. So you're moving a lot of people from a place of uh, trepidation and uncertainty and sometimes legitimate fear and worry to a place of optimism and, you know, like I say, relief and and kind of hope, you know. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Confidence, I can do this, you know. Um, That's probably the overwhelming um, part of it. And then, you know, if you if you flip that coin about, you know, what do most people tell us are their regrets? Well, you know, I didn't do it sooner. I mean, we all say that, every single one of us. I wish I'd done more. I wish I could have done more. Um, you know, I think also a lot of the time, again, to that thing of it's it's easier or more simple than people think, you can often do more than what you actually realise, all right? Like I I thought I could only afford to buy it 400000 and I'd, you know, or 300,000, I'd have to go to a regional town I'd never heard of. But through the plan, I've worked out I can actually purchase it 550 and, or 600 and actually afford that and get a vastly superior, vastly more trustworthy asset, you know? So I love, I, I really, um, you know, I, I want to just talk so much about realizing people's potential and yeah. for them to believe that it's possible in that in that space of opportunity. I mean, yeah. that's that opening that mind to the, but so move quickly through relief and, and into optimism. I yeah. think there's some, that's incredibly powerful um, watching that happen as you take a client on that journey. Um, I, I definitely miss 
that part of uh, of that yeah, client yeah. interaction work in terms of what that looks like. So it's definitely cool. All right, let's do some quick fire questions before we finish off with a couple of rounded out questions. So here's your quick fire ones. The oldest client that you have helped? 61. 61. Okay. The youngest client who's come in to get a property plan or portfolio plan? Uh, a very impressive young man who was 19 at the time, some time ago now, but he, he probably knows who he is. Beautiful. Most interesting line of work that you've you sort of come across in, in terms of careers that people have had? For me, I love working with anaesthetists. Yeah. That was a real interest for me. And, you know, sliding doors moment, I you know, might have done that in another life. But I've also found all the anaesthetists are all slightly nuts. <laughs> in the best way. Shout out to all of those great people that you've helped who are anaesthetists. Shout out to all my clients who are well, anaesthetists. Let's now talk about, okay, well, that anaesthetists are obviously very highly paid because they're putting people to sleep and then very yep. much wanting to wake them up at the right time. Um, okay, let's talk about lowest income that you've worked with. Uh, household income of 60000 single month. Oh, there you go. That's incredible. Highest income? Oh, in excess of a million. Yep. Yeah. I've had, I've, well, I've had one individual that we've worked on that was $18 million per year. Okay. So there you go, some examples of the extremities and and but there's solutions. Go, what do you need us for? You know, like <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, it's about that validation and you know, exactly. basically it's you know, that's that's putting some of that investments into bricks and mortar, right? That's real estate, that's right. long-term thinking. He's yep. setting up his his family office wealth and and you know, legacy for generational wealth, right? There'll be trust yep. funds and all that that'll be set up for the next. 50 kids that run through that household with private schooling and whatever that looks like. Okay. In terms of the lowest number of properties that you've had to recommend? Zero. Zero. Okay. Zero. That, so that is, they've, they've done the accumulation phase and now it's just nothing to yep. do here? Yeah. It's every now and then people come to us for an acid test. You know, we get the experienced investors and there's obviously, that sort of plan's a lot more different because I'm doing a lot of research on existing assets and- yep. You know, I might be saying no properties, but I'm probably saying we're going to change this and tweak that and talk to your mortgage broker about yep. this. But Which one gets sold you, first if we're selling any down to retire exactly. debt, all of those types of things. If you keep doing this, you'll be fine. But and no more to buy. Hmm. Look, they're rare. Like of the 850 I've done, I've probably done less than 10 of those because we're usually meeting people earlier in the piece, right? Yep. But they are very, very satisfying as well. Oh, and it comes back to that point about how we're paid and the fees because... I don't have a boss leaning over my shoulder going, hang on, they can go again. Why are they not? Yeah, exactly. You know? you're, not, you're not getting commissions or kickbacks from builders, developers. Yeah. yeah it makes no difference to my lifestyle. Okay. Highest number of properties that you've recommended? Uh, five. No, there's, there's been a six. There's been a six. Okay. So five yeah. to six. But usually what's the typical? It's two to three nowadays. Yeah, especially with the um, superannuation added onto that. You really yeah. don't need any more for that $2,000 a week story. We always talk about building property portfolios, but that's not at the expense of, or forgetting about other assets like super and things like that. Yeah. Right? Like You don't need to pay for everything out of your properties, but we want a good diversification. Yeah, and the, and the uh, I don't, I don't, advice you've given to someone, what's the biggest number of properties that they've had? 13. 13 in their portfolio past their principal yeah. home. All right, let's move on to the home stretch. So what do you love about being uh, as a QPIA? What what floats your boat in terms uh, of? It's the connection with the clients. Like you said, it's exactly what you miss. You know, yeah. I still get to do it is to build a relationship with people and get kind of get the inside line on what they're doing and, uh, and what makes them tick. And like being able, it sounds fluffy, but being able to help people with these really big stressful decisions is where the reward is. Beautiful. And obviously, how do you measure your success in terms of the work that you do? I think one of the one of the most common ways is obviously finding a workable solution. And like workable is a subjective term, right? Like we can make it work on the projection, but they've also got to want to take ownership of it and actually make it work. So seeing them take action, seeing them stand up a bit straighter because they've got this new found and valid optimism or or the other is, you know, they drop their shoulders because they're not quite as stressed about it anymore, you know? So, I mean, you know, they're quite subjective things, but at the end of the day, that's how being in the strategic part, not necessarily into the implementation part, that's how I measure my success is, is the individual's reactions. 
Yeah, and they've got to, you know, and then hopefully they're taking action, right? I mean, that could be, yeah. it's again what we were talked about before. It's like when I'm getting someone so close to me helping me, but it's the implementation of the plan and making sure you follow through, that yeah. can that can be the one of the regrets of the role, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the, probably the biggest frustration is you spend all this time and, you know, yeah, you might say, ah, oh, you've been doing it for 10 years. It's all autopilot anyway now, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, it's not. It's yeah. not because everyone's situation is unique. And, you know, like I say, I I, I value the clients. Um, I take on what they're trying to work through so I can help them work through it. And so when you see the sugar hit of the plan, but then you see nothing after it, that is that is exceedingly frustrating. Well, I think I think that I mean it's rare. Let's let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, yeah, yeah. fortunately, most people build the confidence. They empower themselves to take action. All of the things that we that we're teaching here, but it, it is frustrating when people are paid a professional fee to someone, and then they don't, they don't you know, they don't. The, the, the solution that they've got isn't necessarily yeah. acted on, or the, you know, they might do one, but then they don't follow up with the other recommendations that are on there. So we always want to make sure we're trying to do that, mate. It's been absolutely awesome in having a chat with you uh, as one of our senior property investment advisors here in Empower. Um, I do want to give you one final chance to share a, a little bit of a memorable story. I know there's, we've talked about hundreds of different case case study examples and clients that, that were originally my clients that are now that you're now looking after. Well, yep. Can you just share just one sort of memorable story that, that just highlights the impact and the transformation of how, you know, the work that you've been able to do with them has really transformed their life for, for the goals that they're going after, but also, you know, that financial security that they've yep. been able to achieve. A recent, recent one that comes to mind, we'll call them Jack and Jill, okay? Um, now, Jack, I did, a, I did some work for pre-COVID. It was probably 2019. A uh, single guy at the time came in, wanted to get on the ladder. So we're having that first purchase conversation, right, that really important one. And, you know, one of the questions I asked at that point is, is this a single man's plan or is it a single lady's plan? Yep. Even if they're in a relationship, sometimes it's not there. But long story short, we purchased a place up in Petrie in Queensland. And then about, we'd had a couple of contacts on email, but no work done between since then and, and this year. And then yep. he contacted me saying, I've met the girl of my dreams. Jill and I have bought, bought a place in Preston and we want to have a bit of a chat to you about what happens next. You know, so sort of taking the rest of the steps, right, rather yeah. than just the initial. So this is where we're starting to talk about an evolution from a single plan into a portfolio plan. And so still had Petrie. That's shot the lights out. That's done really, really well. Preston, good little home, but they aspire for something different. They did what I did a few years ago, mate. They want to get out of the city. Geelong, Torquay, Anglesey, down that area for them. Yeah. I don't know why they should come to the Mornington Peninsula, but that's all right. <laughs> um, so they've gotten married in that time. We end up having a chat. Turns out Jill's mum was my grade eight food tech teacher. <laughs> 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 and um, we had a good conversation. You know, like she, she's, um, she, he's, he's always, he's, his income's just about tripled since I spoke to him. Yeah. And he's always been the, you know, the one driving it, the instigator, whereas Jill was coming along, you know, wanting to understand it, but more cautious. Yep. So we took quite a bit of time stepping through um, uh, what they wanted to do and what's the best way for them to get from where they are living in Preston, where they like it, but that's not where they want to raise their family to being in Geelong. Long, and they, they also wanted to have that conversation that you sort of said about, well, we're about to potentially start a family, so do we buy another investment now? Because that window, that door's going to close. Beautiful. So there's a lot of competing priorities. The, the the long and the short of it was they didn't want to jump straight into a home purchase in Geelong. They wanted to give it a test drive. And what we ended up agreeing was they're going to move down there in about a year or two years' time, basically when the baby arrives, and rent for up to five to seven years. What we're going to do now is we're going to purchase another investment and when they move out of Preston, that will convert to an investment. So they're going to be rent vesters with three properties raising a young family. Then once the second child hits primary school and we don't have that same commitment of, you know, lower income and childcare and things, that's when we're going to go on the home. Beautiful. And 
we, I expect we're going to need to sell something at that point, and that's probably going to be Preston, but we'll find out. Well, I mean, th- there's a perfect example of why it can't be an off-the-shelf, you know, sort of, you know, fitting that shoe into the into the shoe that just everyone's trying to get. It's just not that way in which we work. Yeah. We we ultimately want to find those tailored solutions, and that story is quite unique in terms of yeah. the journey that they've gone on, and it's a tailored outcome. So, mate, I think that's awesome. Well, well, where if you you know back to those sorts of other advisors, they could spend a lot more than what I've recommended they spend on this investment property. Yeah, I love it. But in two three years time, the you know that could have become a problem. Love it. Absolutely love it. Let's now just quickly wrap up. I mean, one of the things I wanted to sort of make sure that that people who are thinking about using a property investment advisor, what do they what do they want out of their property investment advisor? So firstly, what I want to make sure you're focusing in on is that they've got that independence with also a good measure of experience. And so their job is to help you work out what you're trying to do. They want to keep it real. They need to be genuine. They, they really shouldn't be trying to sell you any product, uh, you know, property product. You know, they're truly independent in terms of the work that they're trying to do for you. And yeah. it should be a tailored solution. And they should make sure that it's part of a broader scenario. And then from that, you know, Joel, talk to, talk to us about the outcomes that a client should then experience. If they find that type of person, what, what's the payback that they get from having, you know, an, an experience and relationship with a, a QPIO of that nature? I guess context on the decision that they're about to make. You know, like you don't dabble in property, like you're in or you're out sort of thing, right? Yeah. And so usually the outcome is they're getting past some kind of roadblock. Yep. Um, or they're making a decision on which fork, which fork in the road they're going to go down, you know? Um, yeah. I think also it gives them some comfort around the risks and the, the fact that, you know, they're putting everything in place to make sure they're not going to make a mistake. Yeah. You know, and that comes back to that peace of mind, right? It's that comfort part, the sense of relief. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to put a value on that. Peace of mind is priceless, you know, in a lot of respects in life, right? And then ultimately, if you've, you know, plan to become what you plan to become and you're living that lifestyle by design, then, then ultimately, what sort of value do you put in that type of relationship that you're having with not necessarily just one advisor because you should be your tax advisor, your, you know, people who are helping you with your super, all of those sort of professional advisors, that team of people, your buyer's agents who are going to be out in the field, who are getting, you know, the infield knowledge and using the indicators of the optimization of what you're trying to achieve. So I think that really sums up, you know, if, if you're talking about wanting to have an investment grade or a or a superior experience with a with a property investment advisor. Hopefully, today's episode is is really focused in on what that sort of looks like for you. And you've got plenty of notes in terms of the exploration that you do in terms of making an assessment of who you might choose to work with, because you want to be leveraging all of that talent, all of that skill, all those insights, but also have that sort of trusted advisor insight where they can high five you on the things that you're doing well on but also eyeball you and have honest conversations on the things and areas and where you can improve, right? So it shouldn't be an attack or a, or a big judgment. You can't change the things that have happened in the past, um, but obviously it's about moving forward because I think that's one of the other big regrets. Most people go, oh, God, I wish I had I'd known this earlier. I probably would have given me more confidence to act sooner. And that's yeah. one of the missions that Bryce and I have got, and that's making sure that we act on this particular thing. So any final words, mate? No, thank you for having me. And Hopefully Bryce feels like he can come and fill in my sh- fill my shoes again. <laughs> well, I'm not letting you go just yet. So let's move on to to some right. life hacks. So again, <laughs> with Bryce away, we're going to basically let you play like I did with Brad recently, where I allowed him to also give us any life hacks. So give me give me your best money hack, please. Yep. Best money hack that I've found recently is actually the Chrome extension on Honey or Coupon Birds. They're actually pretty underrated. Because okay. uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself in the tight ass category, but I love a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can you can go on to um, Chrome or Edge or whatever um, platform browser you use, yeah. and add this extension. And then whenever you're checking out of something, it will automatically scan for any discounts, rather than you know some people have to type it into Google and you know it will apply them. So if you just click the button and it 
tests five or six and it'll tell you if you've got the best price or it will add a discount, which oh, I think that's, is That is a great little hack. Yeah. Now, what about for the household? Uh, in in the spirit of frugality and efficiency, clean with vinegar. Angela, yes. my wife, works in this space and everything is cleaned with vinegar. Vinegar and newspaper or just? <laughs> oh, for the fireplace with newspaper, for sure. <laughs> like well, even... you've got, well, you've actually got one for the fireplace, haven't you? Was that Yeah, in behind me. But, I mean, you know, like she, she'll she clean everything with vinegar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's and healthy. then what about in life? What's what's yeah. one of your what's one of your life hacks? Use your manners. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like what Nan said. They cost nothing and they're so powerful, right? Especially in a world as kind of um, siloed where we will, a lot of us work in different locations, using your manners and showing that sign of respect is, I think, incredibly undervalued. Yep. In the current world that we're in, I think a lot of people have lost sight of that, right? With a lot of people yep. whinging and arguing, I think you can be very respectful and also get your point across without necessarily being rude um, in terms having of that. So, having mate, a conversation have, with my boy Max all the time lately. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in that sort of respectful conversations and all of that at the moment as my boys are getting into their teenage years and show some respect and humility. Um, yeah. You know, it's not all about you. So I'm in those conversations at the moment, <laughs> hence the trip to Sri Lanka in terms of showing a diversified look at the world and, and you know, being reminded of people who, who have fortunate uh, outcomes and those people who don't and never lose sight of that, right? There's always people out there who we can help, which is part of that episode in terms of that story. So, mate, thanks very much for joining us. Thank Absolutely you. amazing. I'm going to quickly talk about what's making property news now. Um, the big story for me over the last couple of weeks whilst I've been away is the new implementation into South Australia around new tenancy legislation. And so I've got some links in the show notes, but I'm just going to put a teaser out there for you because we're also in a strong debate right now for New South Wales. And I'll be appearing at a standing committee um, uh, in the next couple of weeks to try and get some um uh, uh, flexibility in this sort of 180 degree turn that's happened in regards to um, the amount of power that's being put in the hands of tenants and taken away uh, from the property owner and the small business owner. And in this particular example, I just want to highlight one of the things that I'm deeply concerned about, and that is that um, with a existing uh, tenant in your property, um, you can't sell that property um, without showing proof of a purchase contract. So let me process that for you, right? So in terms of a, a reason for termination, you've got to show a contract of sale executed by the vendor and the purchaser, which means if you think about it logically, you can't show people through that home and that home in its best condition. So you could be like, you know, whatever, you've hit some difficulty financial situation and you want to basically sell your property. Well, under the new legislation, that's being introduced in South Australia, and it's also being touted in New South Wales, um, you will not be able to remove that tenant before you sell that property. And so that is potentially robbing you of any financial gain that you might be able to make. And you can't style the property, you might be able to clean it up. And so that's highly concerning to the Property Investors Council of Australia, and it should be highly concerning for anyone who runs a small business that they can't, in the event that they want to sell out of that small business, that they can't do so in terms of being able to show that property in its best light. And I find that absolutely ridiculous. And so if you also find that absolutely ridiculous, you need to sign up to Picker because we need to make sure that we're building. We've got thousands of people already signed up, but we need to move that to tens of thousands. So of the 2.3 million property investors out there, we need to build a group of people that can have that influence. And we need to make sure that the politicians know, because at the moment, all they're getting is uh, information from tenancy associations, which are government funded with millions of dollars each year. And so they're hearing all these horror stories. So they think they're doing the right thing, but they're not. They're basically taking the power away from the property owner and the small business owner. So as a property investor, I need you to sign up to Picker. Okay, it's five dollars for a year or twenty dollars for five years, and getting those numbers. And then, if you're really upset about it, you should be writing to your members of parliament um, in the seat that potentially where your property, your investment property is, because the last thing 
the, you know, the, the unintended consequences of what could happen here are significant if more and more people start tapping out of having investment property. So the private rental market will dry up and that will be a worse outcome for those people who are looking for rental properties. And we do need rental property for a lot of mobility, for a lot of economic growth. It's not just for about those unfortunate members of our community who are forced renters. There are lots of people who choose to rent. And so what we are getting is legislation for those most vulnerable and forced renters, and that is going to kill off the property market unless we do something about that from a rental, private rental point of view. So that's that's important. If you've got an investment property in South Australia, read the, the links in the show notes that will allow you to get access to that because I'm super concerned about that. And that's the, really the biggest news story. And that's why we're also doing the work that we did around the survey for New South Wales in terms of what is reasonable grounds. Um, unfortunately, uh, that does not look like they've had any consultation with the property investor. What happened in South Australia is they got the Real Estate Institute of South Australia to talk to. Well, they don't represent the property investment owner. They do not represent that small business and even representing the property investment manager. They're employed by us as property investors. So make no mistake, um, it has not been consulted. We, we as the property investor and the owner of the property have not been consulted. And so I'm taking serious, um, I'm taking that to serious task. It really is a problem. So we need to create that voice, that united voice. So please, if you're not already a member of PICA, now is the time. And it's time to tell your friends and family who also own investment properties that this needs to change because it's getting ridiculous. And we're going to see these types of legislations continue unless we can make sure that we put up a competitive front and tell the alternative side of the story and the unintended, unintended consequences and risks of that. So there's my rant in what's making property news. Thank you for hanging around. And until next week, remember Bryce is back after his European adventure. But until next week, always remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Bye for now.